very best pictures are the ones that you can't describe in words. You just hold it up and there it is, like, whoa. I grew up in Iowa, on a farm near a small town, sort of raised by wolves. I'd never even had a passport. I was just a guy, like, totally wet cement. I was just ready for anything. I went to Africa. It was like a bleeding wound when I first arrived. There weren't that many journalists there. You felt like, if I don't do this, who's gonna do it? I got hooked up with AP pretty much at the beginning. And then September 11 happened. I went straight to Afghanistan. That was the beginning of a 10-year job. Here were the same kind of guys that I was on the wrestling team with when I was a kid. You go out thinking you're gonna say something about the big picture. Inevitably, you end up saying something about regular people. I moved to Asia for AP, and one of the first things that happened is there was a coup in Fiji and family reunions between North Koreans and South Koreans being held in Seoul. I said to my boss, obviously you want me to go to the coup in Fiji. <laughs> and she said, no, of course not. We want you to go to Korea. You're the chief photographer for Asia. This is, this is a historic moment. And I had just come from spending my entire 20s photographing violence, and I just thought of myself a certain way. They sent me to Seoul, and I found myself with a press accreditation badge, something I had never had to do before. It was the first time since the end of the Korean War that family members were reunited. 50 years, and they had only three days together, and then they had to go back and they were never gonna see each other again. I saw mothers and sons just see one another and gasp. There were brothers crying, and they were pushing him away. Just go, just go away. Because it was so painful. That experience changed me as a photographer. I started pushing from that day on to go to North Korea. People don't know anything about it. Like, I don't know where to begin sometimes. They don't know anything about Korea because there's nothing coming out of there. I went for the first time when Clinton sent Secretary of State Albright. We were standing in the palace with this Wizard of Oz looking carpet in this mural 30 feet high of this huge wave. And she looked at me and said, where do you think I should stand? I said, I don't know. Both of us just kind of in another world. And then the door opened and Kim Jong-il walked through the door. It was like stepping into your television screen into, <laughs> into something totally unreal. I went with Albright to some school and they had all these children lined up in perfectly straight lines. And one of them turned around and looked at me and went like this. You know, he was cutting up in class. And I took his photo and I thought, you know, that's what I would have done. It was like the first time that I thought, wow, there's real life here. In Korea, I'm not photographing dramatic, life-changing moments. I want to. I want to take pictures of the biggest news, the most incredible things. But I'm not. I'm taking pictures of people in a bowling alley. Half of what I photograph is through the windows of passing cars. I can't work on pictures the, the way we normally do. I can't go to one place and shoot for four hours in perfect light until the whole dance comes together into some amazing, you know, double page picture. I'm not doing pictures like that in Korea. There are very few Western journalists, myself and the AP reporter, we're the only Americans with regular access. I spent a hundred days or so there last year. Wherever we go, I shoot what I see. But we don't get to go everywhere, that's for sure. I've asked to go to the nuclear reactor. 
I've asked to meet with the leader, Kim Jong-un. They don't put their hand in front of my camera. That doesn't happen. And they don't review any of my material before I put it out on the AP wire. I'm just trying to make real pictures of real moments in people's lives. I think it gets hard for them to understand. They say, why did you take a picture of that empty road? Couldn't you have taken a picture when there was more traffic there? And I said, no, I was taking a picture of the empty road because there's no cars on it. And that's very different from Interstate 80 where I grew up. So I have something to say with that picture. Why are you photographing people waiting for the bus in the morning? Are you trying to make us look poor or what is it? And I'd say, you know, everybody waits for the bus in the whole world. We all get it. We all hate to get up in the morning and commute to work. And this picture represents that and people get it. I get up and feed the AP wire every single day. But then I look back at it and it starts to become even more important to me as a piece of history. I saw a guy coming up the escalator. And when he got to the top step, he took his daughter by her hands and lifted her up. It's exactly what anyone with a daughter does. And I put that picture out and people asking me, they're all actors, they did it all for you. Is it that hard to believe that someone, even in North Korea, loves his daughter and buys pants and buys shoes? Those pictures carry weight. It's not just hostile governments dueling against one another. This is real, and people have lives like I have. Pretty much anywhere you stand, you can see a statue peeking up over the hill or behind a building or down the corner. You go to a stadium and there are 150,000 people. Everybody in the seat is one pixel. And they're making these changing mosaics, all to show support for the leadership. It's an incredible thing to see. They don't have access to our version of the news. They don't have access to the internet. It's sort of like reality is on a need-to-know basis there. They're very eager to take us and show their side of the story. And it's my job to filter that or to comment on what I think is true or not true through my photography. So yeah, they take us to a lot of things that are clearly propaganda. This is what I'm fighting against when I'm there because they have an image they want to project and a propagandist is not a dirty word there. I think that if they want to be a part of the world like everybody else, that they have to open up. And I think maybe that's part of why they let this happen. There's a lot of bumps in the road, for sure, that began really with the fact that their idea of journalism couldn't have been more different than any other place on Earth. They try to control it, of course, but I think that they cannot be a working member of the planet without letting information come and go from their country. Every time I've gone back, it's gotten a little more open. Suddenly, they announced foreigners can bring their phones into the country. And then they announced that they were going to open up a 3G phone network. So, wow, I can post to Instagram from the street, wherever I'm standing. And I'm getting immediate, real-time feedback from people. It's become a super important tool in the photojournalist tool belt. People think that Korea is just another planet. And people in Korea think that Americans are devils. <laughs> That's what they're taught in school. Their whole identity is built around this hostile relationship with the United States and their neighbors. 
I think that they keep their people separate from the rest of the world to maintain control. Their country is based on self-sufficiency, and they're not pulling it off. Kim Jong-un has tried to put a facelift on the capital, at least. There's movie theaters, restaurants, new apartment complexes. When I went through there last time, I saw people sitting outside, reading, using the light of these buildings because they don't have light in their apartments. So sitting on the sidewalk, studying, it's an example of their lack of resources and their priorities. When you leave Pyongyang, there's a big fall off. They live in communal farms, they work in the fields, there are trucks that run on barrels of burning wood. I mean, you step back in time a bit when you get out into the countryside. I went to a vocational school where you could learn to drive a tractor. And on the screen, it had this kind of pong-looking driving simulator. And there was a boy in his school uniform, you know, shifting gears and learning. It was a, it was a practice tractor. I show the same picture outside and people say, oh my god, you know. It's a completely different understanding of what they're seeing. It's always useful anywhere in the world for people to understand each other. And for people to look hard at someone else's life and imagine that that could be them. You know, the most mundane pictures sometimes are the ones that are the most powerful, especially in Korea. If I can show people shopping, commuting to work, um, laughing, you know, getting in an argument, all the things you do anywhere else in the world, it starts to build a connection between people, them and the outside world, and there's no connection right now.